Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is William Bernstein, financial theorist and historian. He is the author of A Splendid Exchange, How Trade Shaped the World. Bill, welcome to Econ Talk. Well, I'm a uh, fan of uh, the podcast, and I'm honored to be here. Great. Your book is an extraordinary uh, survey of the role of trade in world history, and as I think one of the reviewers pointed out, it's almost a history of the world as much as it is a history of trade. It's really a, a tour de force. And I want to start with ancient times, where you start, and I want to talk about the spice trade, because as a modern, it's a great mystery how spices became so important in ancient times. Uh, we totally take spices for granted. There are a few exceptions, uh, but most spices are treated as so inex- – they're so inexpensive. Salt, sugar, uh, the various exotic spices, rosemary, sage – even saffron, uh, they're all access, easily accessible to us at, at relatively low prices. Uh, why were they so important in ancient times, and why were they so uh, decisive in, in trade? Well, first of all, what I'd, I'd like to do before I really answer that question is to destroy uh, a couple of myths surrounding them. Uh, there really is nothing uh, in particular about these spices, and we're really talking about four or five of them. We're talking about uh, nutmeg and mace, which of course come from the same plant. We're talking about cloves, which come uh, from from a very closely related uh, tree or shrub, uh, and then there's cinnamon, uh, and these were the fine spices because they came from very far away from Europe, from the Moluccas and from uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, pepper was a higher volume uh, and somewhat less prestigious spice, uh, and uh, that, that provides, I think, some of the hint. Uh, so we're talking about, really, a, a very small group of spices. Europeans actually had access to a lot of the spices that you, that you mentioned, uh, and they were particularly valued, uh, and that, that provides, I think, some of the clue. One of the things you'll hear is that they were valued because they, they uh, suppressed the smell of rotting meat uh, or because they preserved meat. That explanation really makes absolutely no sense because these were extremely expensive items. They sold for more than their price uh, uh, weight in gold in, in, in rare instances. And meat was, you know, pennies on the pound, so it didn't make any economic sense to buy spices to preserve meat. Uh, it was theorized that some, some modern historians have theorized that it had to do with their pharmacologic properties, but in fact we now know that they really don't have any. Uh, and in fact, the pharmacologic properties they had simply, you know, stemmed from their placebo value because they were so expensive. The reason why they were so expensive to start with was because they simply came from so far away. Uh, Sri Lanka and particularly the Spice Islands uh, were thousands of miles beyond the geographic, beyond the geographic horizon of Europe. Uh, and so it was terribly expensive in that era to transport something, say, from, you know, just off the west coast of New Guinea to around Africa or through uh, uh, Arabia, uh, through the Middle East to, to Europe. Uh, the second reason uh, why they were so uh, highly valued was simply because of the, the mystery that surrounded them. Uh, you know, the Moluccas were four or 5,000 miles beyond the geographic horizon of Europe, as I mentioned. And so when you combined this expense in transport and this very expensive supply chain, uh, with the mystery, you got a perfect marketing storm. Uh, and the, the four fine spices were the BMW and the Godiva chocolate uh, and, the, and the Gucci shoe of their era all rolled up into one. When you walked into someone's house and you smelled their aroma, it announced here resides someone of wealth and power and status. They were simply the ultimate uh, status symbol. But a lot of these spices, uh, particularly pepper, as you mentioned, did come in relatively large volume. And the puzzle for me, and maybe I'm just misperceiving it, and maybe we talk about spices a lot because of their exoticness even today and and the distance they traveled, but I get the impression that they were a significant portion of world trade. And the puzzle then is, well – 
they were luxury. As you say, they announced great wealth. The number of people with great wealth was relatively limited. Uh, so in this story, if I'm telling it correctly, and please stop me if I'm wrong, a very small number of the elite people of Europe, say, were uh, generating an enormous portion of the trade uh, of, it, of the day in these luxury items. Is that true? Yeah, I think I think that's largely true. Pepper is an intermediate case. Uh, pepper was less expensive because it came, uh, at least Europe's pepper and China's pepper too, came from the Malabar Coast. And the Malabar Coast was a relatively straight shot uh, to Europe. You could get across the um, uh, the Gulf of uh, Arabia on one monsoon to Yemen or to Cairo uh, or to Jeddah, and then you were, you know, it found its way into the hands of, of uh, Venetian merchants. By the way, when you go to Venice, uh, and you see all the grand palazzos and the wonderful architecture, and you marvel at it. What you're looking at is 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 the wealth of uh, that uh, is is the wealth that was created uh, by uh, this this trade. This trade was almost exclusively uh, responsible for uh, most of the grand architecture you see in Venice. Hmm. So yeah, so 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 pepper was sort of a, an, an exceptional case, but in the case of the four fine spices, uh, you're right. You're talking about uh, something that really could only be afforded by the the elite. Is that true of the other products that that were coming over uh, from far away? Obviously, silks being an obvious example, but is that true for for a significant portion of of human history before uh, the big drop in transportation costs and the security issue? which you discuss in the book at great length, uh, the role of piracy, as it diminishes, obviously the price can come down as well. But is it true then that, that for much of, of pre-modern history that uh, the trade was in these luxury items only? There was nothing for the masses? Yeah, I think that you can, you know, very roughly, and this is obviously an artificial uh, categorization, you can divide the history of trade into three periods. There's a, an early period uh, which goes up to around the year 1600 1700 when really only the elite people, you know the elite members of society were able to afford these luxury items that could be transported over great distances now there were ballast goods uh you know you you, you had to have very dense heavy goods in the bottoms of your ships and so porcelain uh which wasn't terribly expensive in china uh particularly the export porcelain could fill the the, the, the hold the bottom of a ship as could rice uh, but but these weren't financially that important. The the, the real money was was in spices. And then you can there, there's sort of an intermediate period, a second period, when when sail transport got to be really very efficient, and the middle class, the evolving middle class in Europe, began to afford goods such as cotton and and some beverages, which we make we might talk about later, particularly coffee and particularly uh, tea. Uh, and and certainly you know by by the the 18th century. Uh, the consumption of tea had reached very far down the uh, the social the, the social scale in England, and then finally, you know, with the invention of of uh, modern transport and particularly the steam engine, uh, we have mass goods being consumed by everybody going around the world, and sometimes a a, a cycle, uh, a manufacturing cycle, you know, 120 years ago, uh, in 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 very uh, heavy bulk, cheap bulk goods. Uh, which uh, spanned uh, the globe a couple times before the product was finally made. Uh, the example I use there is the example of uh, copper production. A huge portion of trade, the reason I pick spices is that spices are sort of the quintessential example, the ones you mentioned, of things that you literally can't make yourself. Uh, it's not just that you don't make them as cheaply or as well as other people. You, there's geographic reasons for the fact that you can't have them, or at least it's very hard to, to grow them where you are. Uh, the climate the soil, etc. And so trade in that era, which was a huge portion of human history, was trade for stuff you couldn't make. Um, and we, we tend to think of trade today as trade for stuff we can't make. As individuals, certainly, I don't make my own clothes. I buy them. I don't raise my own cattle. I don't grow my own corn. I buy them. And I don't know how to make those things. But of course, those, are, those choices are endogenous. Those are choices that are I've made because of my alternatives are so easily gained through trade. And so in the modern world, we trade stuff that we could make ourselves, but other people can make more cheaply. Whereas in much of ancient times, people traded stuff they literally couldn't get unless they traded for it. 
Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, I think you know the, the the shorthand you could you could you could ascribe to that, or you could you could you could flap onto that, is that you know the ancient in the ancient world of trade, it was a strategic or a uh, it was basically a strategic uh, trade. Uh, in other words, you you know the, the the primary trade in the in the ancient period, and when I say ancient, I mean you know classical uh, antiquity, uh, and even before that. Uh, you know, to create the dawn of civilization in in the Indus Valley and in the Mesopotamian valleys, uh, was was in the most strategic of materials, uh, copper and tin, in in particular, going in one direction, grain going going in the other. Uh, the Sumerians couldn't make copper, no matter how hard they tried. There wasn't any copper in in Mesopotamia, so they had to go uh, to the Southern Arabian Peninsula uh, to to get it. Uh, you know, when when the Bronze Age. Uh, dawned, uh, and people needed tin to make bronze. The, the, the people in the Mediterranean basin consumed large amounts of it. They hadn't the foggiest idea where it was actually coming from because the supply chain was so tortuous. And we still really don't know where they got their, <laughs> precisely where they got their tin from. Whereas today we live in a Ricardian world. Uh, where, you know, you buy something from somewhere, not because you can't make it yourself, but because you can get it 5% cheaper. Yeah. Uh, well, let's turn to a, a slightly more advanced product, not much uh, than the spices, and that's the case of sugar. Uh, sugar today is, is quote, dirt cheap. I guess that uh, might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's darn close. Sugar is incredibly inexpensive. Tell us about uh, some of the adventures of sugar in the world, and you have an interesting story on how it affected uh, uh, Jews uh, at one point. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a wonderful story. Uh, you know, sugar at one time could be considered a fine spice. It was nearly as expensive as the four fine uh, spices, and the reason why it was expensive was not because it came from far away. Uh, in fact, uh, by the medieval period, sugar manufacture was well manufacture was well established uh, in the Mediterranean basin. The reason why it was so expensive is simply because it's so brutally hard to manufacture. You have to cut cane, which is very labor-intensive and extremely hard work. Uh, you then have to boil the cane down, which is even harder, hotter work, and requires vast amounts of wood, of fuel, which Europe was fast running out of uh, at, by that period. Uh, and then finally, it requires great skill to refine, to take this brown sludge uh, that you get and refine it into crystalline uh, sugar. So it was an extremely expensive process. And as the new world opened up and as sugar technology advanced, it gradually became less expensive. It, in fact, became, at, at one point, the primary route to wealth for any up-and-coming up, up uh, European during the 17th century. If you were a young man on the make, you went to the new world and you established a sugar plantation. The new world had easy access to fuel, big forests. Uh, it had easy access to labor, uh, slave labor from Africa. Uh, you could get a slave across uh, the, the Middle Passage in six weeks or even, sometimes even three weeks from Angola, uh, and slaves were not that expensive. Uh, and finally, the, the, the technology advanced. There was a device called the three-roller mill, which uh, allowed three or four slaves to crush vast amounts of cane. And so the price of it fell, and as the price of it fell, uh, consumption gradually rose. Now, there's another character of sugar, which is that it's the heroin of foodstuffs. Uh, no society ever decreases uh, its, uh, its consumption of sugar. Babies will drink sugar water in preference to mother's milk in many cases. Uh, and and uh, it's the only chemical compound, if you think about it, that human beings will happily consume in its pure form. Uh, so you combine these two things and you get a falling uh, uh, price of sugar and just a vast uh, long-distance uh, industry. Now, the way the Jews got into the story is, is even more interesting, and it's particularly interesting when you relate it to the intellectual history of trade, um, which is that in the year 1494, uh, King Manuel of Portugal uh, gave, uh, following the cue of the Spanish uh, monarchy uh, two years before, uh, gave an ultimatum to the Jews and said, you know, leave or convert. And by the way, don't worry about it. You've got 30 years to make this decision, 40 years to make this decision. Uh, but he went back on his word, and after about a decade or so, he began slaughtering the Jews. And so they, as the, and the Muslims as well, to whom he had given the same ultimatum. And the Jews, uh, wound up by and by in Amsterdam. Uh, probably for our purposes, the most famous family that, that went uh, was were, were the Ricardos. Uh, 
who uh, then eventually went on to to England, uh, and uh, and uh, of course these these were Portuguese speaking Jews, and so when the Portuguese settled Brazil, Brazil rapidly became the biggest sugar producer in the world. Uh, the, the Portuguese were much more industrious and much more efficient than the Spaniards, who were more interested in extractive industries, uh, particularly mining uh, silver. And of course, we, we all know in this audience about the resource curse. So the, the, uh, the Portuguese, which didn't have the resource curse, uh, uh, were, were better entrepreneurs. And they took over the sugar industry of Brazil, which rapidly became the world's largest sugar uh, producer. And the Jews, uh, by way of the West India Company, which ran this trade, the Dutch West India Company, which ran the trade, wound up uh, in very high positions in the, in the West India Company and also began running the, running the sugar trade uh, in, in Brazil. Um, uh, and the, the way they began running it in Brazil is when the Dutch got interested in the trade. That's, I guess, a piece that I left out was that during the early 17th century, the Holland and, and, and Portugal uh, engaged in this vast world war in which uh, the, the Dutch tried to wrest the sugar uh, uh, market from the uh, from the Portuguese uh, in the west, in the western hemisphere, and the um, the uh, uh, spice trade in the Eastern Hemisphere, and the Dutch succeeded completely uh, in the Indian Ocean, taking over the, uh, the Western, taking over the spice trade, which is a story we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but in the Western Hemisphere, they didn't succeed. They, they succeeded temporarily. They actually, the Dutch took over a, uh, about a thousand miles of Brazilian coastline, and that's how these Portuguese-speaking Dutch Jews got to, uh, got to Brazil. But it all came tumbling down after 1640 when Portugal regained its independence from Spain. Portugal and Spain had been more or less uh, unified uh, between about 1580 and 1640. And when that, when that ended, um, the Portuguese uh, settlers in Brazil rose up and threw the Dutch out. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Dutch Jews scattered back uh, home. Some of them went to North America. And the very first Jews uh, to arrive uh, in what became the United States uh, were 23 Jews who arrived uh, in New York City uh, in the mid-17th uh, century uh, as part of this diaspora. So it's quite a Quite a quite a journey, a long distance journey for that period. You know, from Portugal to uh, Holland to uh, Brazil, Dutch Dutch Portuguese Brazil, and then finally to the New World. Well, it also helped me understand something I never knew about, which was I knew that David Ricardo's family had sent him back to uh, had sent him to Amsterdam for school, uh, which was presumably a Jewish education. As a young boy, I never knew why they picked Amsterdam, but that's because they started there. And yeah, they started. They started, and, and actually, their their story is even more interesting um, because uh, they they actually before they came to Amsterdam, when they when they when they when they escaped from Portugal, they went they went first to Livorno, which was one of the great free trade states uh, of of that era. It was a free port, uh, and Italy, they engaged right? in the coral trade there. And then when that trade dried up, they wound up finally going to Amsterdam. And Amsterdam now has a uh, still has a large Jewish population in the diamond business. I don't know yeah, if there's any connection yeah. to that, but yeah, and, and, and of course they for for many years that was a you know an area of Smithian specialization for for Jews. You couldn't you couldn't make a living in Europe uh, as a Jewish farmer, uh, mm -hmm. and so you wound up in in cognitive trades such as uh, you know finance and uh, and uh, the diamond trade. Probably a blessing in disguise. Well, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to get too much into racial issues here, but I, I think that most uh, geneticists who look at it believe that uh, uh, Jews uh, have somewhat higher IQs than, than the normal population. At least, at least the Ashkenazi Jews do. And there's something called the Cohen modal haplotype, which haplotype, which is a, a genetic marker, uh, which probably relates in some way to IQ, which got selected for. I mean, if you were a Jew. In, in the shtetl, uh, you, uh, uh, your, 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 your chances of reproducing were better if your high cognitive skills were high uh, than if you say, came from a farming background. Uh, I was thinking and, more of uh, Milton Friedman's observation that if you're living in an anti-Semitic world, it's better to have your property in portable form rather than in non-portable form. And two very portable forms of capital are human capital, the most portable because you have it with you all the time. And diamonds are pretty good for physical capital. 
because they're yeah, small. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very true. Uh, well, let's go back to the Portuguese, because uh, I had a question for you that uh, prompted, your book prompted, which I, I've thought about a little bit recently. I have no, it's none of, or any historical understanding of the issue, and I thought maybe you could help me understand it, which is that the Portuguese, and the Spanish for that matter, in, in the late 15th century were, were doing awfully well. Um, what happened to them? What was what was the source of? It seems that their downfall economically uh, was swift. What uh, what happened to the Portuguese and the, possibly the Spanish that uh, explains their uh, their relatively uh, quiet performance on the international scene after that? Well, the real the real question is is not how they 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 fell so swiftly. The, the, the real question is how they rose so rapidly, particularly the Portuguese, because the Portuguese were a nation in the year 1600 of roughly a million people. At any one time, they couldn't put more than a couple dozen warships and large merchantmen uh, onto the ocean. And as one of your previous guests, uh, uh, Timothy Brook, very nicely pointed out in, in his book, uh, you know, most Portuguese ships had a, a very thin upper crust of European Portuguese crew, uh, and just about everybody else were were, were, were either Muslims or black slaves, uh, so they couldn't even crew their their own ships. Um, the, the 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 metaphor that I like to use is that Portugal is the dog that caught the car, uh, and what what happened in order to understand this, you have to understand what trade looked like in the in, in Asia before uh, Vasco da Gama rounded uh, the Cape in 1498. Uh, the during that period, world trade, the major axis of world trade, ran through uh, Asia, and particularly through the Indian Ocean, because, of course, uh, particularly in that era, uh, sea trade was much more physically efficient and less dangerous uh, than, than land transport. And this trade was run by, uh, basically, a, a heterogeneous group of Muslim merchants. Some were black, some were Indian, uh, some were Malay, and this 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 network of of Muslim merchants who have observed the same institutional core rules, you could call it Sharia commercial law, uh, if if you would, basically ran the trade all the way from Cairo to China uh, and Japan. And of course, China and Japan didn't like its uh, its citizens traveling abroad. So most of the trade all the way up to that point was run by these Muslim merchants. And what happened was was that this world was devastated in the 14th century uh, with the Black Death. Uh, we think that Europe was devastated by the Black Death, but uh, in fact, this was a, a disease of advanced trading societies because it was spread by trade, essentially. Uh, rapidly, you needed a rapidly moving ship to transport the rats and the fleas. And so the most advanced societies, that is the Muslim societies of the era, were, uh, were, were the ones that were uh, most seriously damaged. And so when da Gama rounds the Cape in 1498, he's facing a world which is broken, uh, which, is, which is greatly weakened. And so a couple of Portuguese uh, ships are able to uh, largely take over the long-distance uh, trade uh, of the era, and by the year 1512, a uh, convoy run by Antonio de Bru winds up finally the first Westerners to get to, uh, to the Spice Islands uh, and to run that trade. So you have this very small, weak European nation that is dominating this very large uh, area of trade, and they they try desperately to control it by controlling the choke points at Malacca, which they were able to control, and Hormuz, which they were able to control. Uh, but they were never able to control uh, the Bab el Mandeb or Bab el Mandeb, which is the entrance to the Red Sea at what is now Yemen, what used to be called Arabia Felix, and what. That happened is it allowed spices to leak through uh, that route, uh, which was the traditional route, all the way to, to Venice. So they never really controlled the trade. And, you know, by the time the, uh, the, the Dutch uh, and then the English, uh, with their East India companies, uh, got their act together which much, with much larger convoys and much better capitalization, uh, they were able to very quickly uh, sweep the, uh, the Portuguese from the field. And that's, that's another thing which is, which, which is with the other key part of the puzzle, which is that the Portuguese capital markets were very weak. Their interest rates were very, interest rates were very high in Portugal. The crown uh, was a very unreliable borrower. So the cost of capital was enormous. Uh, 
uh, the Dutch famously had a much lower cost of capital, and so they were able to uh, uh, you know, buy trade goods and mount uh, expeditions, expensive expeditions, uh, and uh, they were able to do things on a much larger scale. But notoriously, sometimes when the Portuguese merchants arrived in the Spice Islands, they were so poorly capitalized, they had so few trade goods, they couldn't even buy spices. Really, it's very interesting. Uh, let's turn to a revisionist story, at least from my perspective, which I enjoyed very much, which is the uh, Boston Tea Party. You gave uh, you give a very different account than I think uh, most of us learned in in high school, if we learned it at all. Uh, tell us uh, what was really going on there. What were the economic forces that were at, at work? Well, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, a lot of things that. There's an enormous amount of revisionist uh, history out there. I mean, history, of course, is are, are myths commonly agreed upon by the victors, uh, and and we have a lot of those stories. Every race has their own sort of fairy tales uh, about 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 their origins and their myths about their origins. Probably the person who had the most myths surrounding him was was Columbus. Uh, you know, Columbus. Well, certainly, you know, by the medieval period, uh, no educated pe- person thought that the world was round, and Columbus was fabulously wrong about his estimation of the size of the globe. And the reason why people ridiculed him was not because he thought the world was round, but because he got the size of the world so very wrong. Uh, and in the process of being wrong, he discovered a new continent. And as you uh, point out, if he'd been if if he had not discovered that continent, he would have died because he wouldn't have uh, hit land before he could reprovision. Yeah, yeah, he, he'd have never. Ma- if, if, if the North America wasn't there, he would have never, ever made it to Asia via his route. He wouldn't, his, his ships weren't well enough provisioned. So he was very lucky he bumped into the New World. Uh, and, and so that's certainly true of the Boston Tea Party. The, 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 the story that we're taught in, in high school about the Boston Tea Party and in maybe junior high is that these were patriots who were protesting against, you know, uh, taxation without representation. Uh, that had nothing to do with it. That was a completely false story. Uh, in fact, what actually happened was uh, that in the year 1773, the English government was trying to help the uh, the East India Company, and the way it tried to do that was by opening up the tea market uh, in in in, uh, in in the American colonies. Previously, the way it had worked before was the, the East India Company, which ran the tea trade. They're, they're the people who got the tea from from China. Weren't allowed to sell um, in, uh, in, in the colonies, what became the United States. Uh, and uh, so this drove the price of tea up greatly because you had to operate through all these middlemen uh, and because the, the price of tea was so high and, and taxes on it were so high, there was a large amount of smuggling. And in the year 1773, they, the Brits decided to rationalize all this. They said, okay, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the East India Company can now uh, sell its tea directly to the, the colonies. Uh, and of course, the middlemen, uh, the special interests, were, were up in arms because this drove the price of tea down uh, to about half of what it had been, greatly benefiting uh, American consumers. In fact, you know, American consumers consumed a huge amount of tea, two and a half pounds of tea per year per person, which, you know, two and a half pounds of tea is a lot of tea. Uh, and so the middlemen and the smugglers got together and they painted themselves uh, in grease paint and put blankets on and uh, and started tossing uh, the first shipments of tea uh, into Boston Harbor. And so that the so in a way the uh, Boston Tea Party was the first American uh, anti globalization riot. Well, but weren't they 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 were protectionist in spirit? Oh yes, they they were they were, they were classic protectionist special interests. Absolutely. Uh, which is really sort of the opposite of what you think, uh, what I normally think of, which is, you know, they were against this tax, which they wanted to be uh, liberated from. So I always thought of them as more free traders. So it's very, uh, it's very depressing, really. Yeah. The other really interesting thing about this story is, is the person who broke it, um, was Arthur Meyer Schlesinger. That is, uh, the famous Arthur M. Schlesinger, the Kennedy aide's, uh, father. Speechwriter, yeah. Yeah. And he he was a I think you said it's from an article in the earliest early part of the twentieth century. Is that right? Yeah, he, he, I think it was published in nineteen seventeen, something yeah. like that. Uh, let's uh, move to a more modern uh, story, slightly more modern as we move forward, and then we'll get to the present. Um, talk about the role of of the Cord Laws in England and and Cobden in bringing well, about more free trade. 
Yeah. Well, you know, the corn the corn laws were uh, a, 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 a bunch of statutes that go back to the early medieval period, you know, not long after the Norman conquest, having to do with the import and export and selling of corn. Now, when you say corn, you don't mean corn because corn was maize. Uh, what we call, well, what we call corn is actually what Europeans called maize, which, which they didn't know about until uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the voyages of discovery. And so corn meant grain. In Europe, corn and you know when you see an old an old name of the company the the corn company they're really talking about grain and they're talking about primarily wheat um and england had been pretty self sufficient it didn't import a lot it didn't export a lot of wheat um and that changed very rapidly after the revolutionary settlement of 1689 uh when england which was the point at which england settled down and developed its capital markets uh became a constitutional monarchy and became rich uh and for a while england was a big exporter of grain uh but then uh w- when the french wars started in the later part of the the 18th century uh they and their population grew very rapidly they began to import uh grain um, but the price of grain stayed relatively stable, and people could afford it. Um, and it wasn't until the Napoleonic Wars, when England really began requiring large amounts of grain, and that really spiked up the price of, of commodities, and particularly grain wars tend to do that to the price of com- prices of commodities, that it became an issue. Uh, and it was it, it, the, the, the structure of the Corn Laws were complex. Uh, there were there were many different structures, but basically what they did was they, they they acted as a subsidy. They were taxes on the price of grain when the price of grain fell below a certain level. So they guaranteed, if you will, the 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 domestic producers of grain who were the landed aristocracy a price so if you kept the artificially kept the price of grain up which is what the corn laws did that benefited the landed aristocracy and it very badly hurt the the, the impoverished not only the impoverished masses of of England but also the the uh, cotton manufacturers as well uh, and so what happened was uh, is that uh, a couple of very draconian corn laws were passed in the year 1804 and then in the year 1815 uh, which caused a great deal of pain among poor people uh, in England and people began began starving in England for that reason uh, because they simply couldn't afford the grain to keep up the profits of these rich rich landowners and a man by the name of Richard Cobden uh, realized that that this was wrong uh, there was there was a moral side to this now he was also a, a cotton manufacturer who had his own interests in it or he was a cotton printer uh, but you know when you look at Cobden's life you could see that his life was about moral issues it wasn't about Profit. He simply believed that free trade, and he was also a pacifist, uh, was 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 a, was a very morally cogent uh, issue. Uh, and the way he was able to get the Corn Laws repealed was really quite fascinating because he 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 came of age when the franchise of England was greatly uh, expanded uh, before the the reforms of 1832. Only seven percent of Englishmen could vote. You had to have a freehold, a two a forty shilling freehold. You had to own property that could produce. 40 shillings of income a year in order to vote. So that kept the landed aristocracy uh, in power. Uh, so when the Reform Act of 1832 passed, that gave him an opening. And the other thing which gave him an opening, which is just, to me, the most fascinating part of the story, was the establishment of the penny post. Uh, yeah, di- digress on uh, how postage evolved. Yeah. Uh, it's not just postage. It's, it also has to do with you know the levers of power in, in, in modern societies. You know, George Orwell's view of technology and repression was that technology advantaged the state and the rich and the powerful. Uh, but in fact, we now know that that's not true. Uh, we know that uh, with the rise of information technology, it actually empowers those uh, who are powerless. Uh, with you know cell phone cameras and the internet, and the, the 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 equivalent of what happened back then was that it used to be that postage was extremely expensive and was actually paid by the recipient. So you know to send a letter simply from London to Edinburgh cost about a shilling, uh, which was you know a large fraction of a day's wage for someone. So and the recipient would, not knowing who necessarily who the sender was, would not want to pay it and not. Yeah, and, and, and there were all sorts of 
excuses and people, you know, if you look at documents from the era, you see that people will actually, would, would actually reuse paper and they would write along one axis and then they would turn the paper 90 degrees when they were done with it. And they would write another letter at 90 degrees over the old writing, you know, just, just to save paper, just to save weight. That's how expensive it was. Uh, and so a man by the name of uh, uh, Taylor uh, gets together with Cobden and says, you know, you could really use uh, lower postage so you could get your message across. And uh, he and Cobden get together and pass the penny post, uh, which allows you to send letters uh, for a penny. And, you know, they, they sort of wonder, well, how do we make this work? And Well, maybe we can use some sort of stamp. You know, so that's the, the modern, the, the origin of the modern postage stamp. And as soon as the law was passed, as soon as the penny post law was passed, Cobden, you know, was supposed to have shouted, there go the corn laws. Because suddenly he and his organization were able to, to organize themselves and to get their message across cheaply. Uh, you know, in an era when only the very richest people can communicate with each other and travel, uh, that's an era when poor people are disempowered. And when you give poor people the ability to travel and to communicate cheaply, you empower them. And that's what happened in the situation. So, you know, a lot of other events transpired, mainly having to do with uh, a bad winter in the year 1845 uh, and uh, the, the Irish potato blight, which uh, caused widespread uh, disaffection among uh, England's poorer classes. Uh, and finally, you know, a man by the name of Robert Peel winds up back in office, who was a visionary uh, Tory leader who realized that he had to, to uh, go against the landed interests of his party uh, and betray them and uh, for the sake of the country. And he, he saved the country and, uh, and uh, also destroyed his own political career in the process by getting, finally getting the law repealed in the year 1846. So that's the story of the Corn Law. But of course, as economists, we have this very um, romantic idea that it was merely the eloquence of Cobden and others, which I'm sure contributed, and, and Adam Smith and David Ricardo had had laid down the intellectual foundations for Cobden's case against the Corn Laws. But as you point out, uh, the uh, starvation of the British people probably had a lot had a lot to do with it, maybe a lot more to do with it than, than the eloquence of the speaking. Yeah, I, I, I think it was um, I'm sure somebody, I think it was Joe Stiglitz, who very famously said that even if Cobden had, had a stammer and spoke only in Yiddish, that the Corn Law would still have been repealed in the year 1846. And I think that's a bit of an exaggeration because Cobden was a, was a, was a force of nature. He was terribly eloquent. Uh, the people he worked with were terribly effective and eloquent as were, and he was a brilliant the tactician and, strat- and, 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 and a brilliant p- political strategist. He, he invented a lot of uh, political techniques that we see that are, that are used even today or have been elaborated. He basically invented them. So I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but certainly it wasn't just Cobden and his eloquence and his brilliance that, uh, that repealed the Corn Law. Although I may have kept them at bay uh, yeah. a- after that. Uh, I do want to mention to our listeners that next uh, week, probably, or certainly in the near future, I'll be uh, interviewing John Nye, uh, economic historian here at George Mason, on his book on the French and British uh, uh, trade relations and how wine and beer were uh, treated by each uh, respective by the respective countries. Uh, John has a very revis- revisionist approach as well, suggesting that uh, England was not as free trade as it's portrayed, and that France was actually uh, more free trade than we think. So um, I just wanted to mention that in advance. Um, You talk about, uh, in that evolution of the arguments for for trade, going back to Smith and Ricardo, you uncover uh, a person I had not heard of, Henry Martin, uh, 75 years before Adam Smith, who had some very eloquent things to say about trade. Uh, How'd you find him, and um, what did he have to say? Well, I I have to give complete credit uh, on this to uh, to Doug Irwin at Dartmouth. Uh, You know, he... uh, uh, in, in his two uh, very fine books, and I think this one comes from Against the Tide, is how I got introduced to him. Uh, but uh, but uh, he, he's a very interesting character. Martin uh, lived uh, in the uh, late 17th, early uh, 18th uh, century, and he published uh, a, um, uh, a tract uh, called Considerations Upon the East India uh, Trade, which is a very obscure tract, and, and that 
day at a time, uh, I doubt it got very much uh, uh, attention. But when you read it, it's a revelation. Uh, because, you know, he first of all destroys the mercantilist uh, uh, argument, uh, the ideology of the era. Most, most economists, most even well-educated people back then believed that a nation was wealthy in proportion to the amount of gold and silver that it had. So you wanted to maintain a positive trade balance. Uh, you wanted to only deal in high-value manufactured items and only import uh, 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 raw materials. So it was a beggar-thy-neighbor uh, situation. And, and you know, Martin was the very first person, at least that we know of, who looked at it and said, this doesn't make any sense. You know, nations are rich, not uh, to the extent of how much gold and silver they have sitting in their vaults. They're rich to the extent of how much they can, they're able to consume. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, he says that they are, they are um, you know, he looked at Holland and said, look, this is the richest nation in the world because they consume so much cloth, so much food, so much silk, so much wine. Uh, and, you know, the Spaniards are dirt poor, yet they have all the silver. Uh, so he said there's, there's something wrong uh, with this. Then there's this wonderful eloquent passage, which I, which, I, which I just have to read. This will be about a 60-second passage. Uh, he says, Why are we surrounded by the sea? Surely that our wants at home might be supplied by our navigation into other countries, at least with the least and easiest labor. By this we taste the spices of Arabia, yet we never feel the scorching sun which brings them forth. We shine in silks which our hands have never wrought. We drink vineyards, uh, vineyards which we've never planted. Uh, the treasures of the mines are ours, in which we have never digged. We only plow the deep and reap the, reap the harvest of every country in the world. Oh, that's uh, spectacular. Yeah, it's just, just an astonishing uh, quote for, for, for that era. What a, what, a, what a poetic line. We only plow the deep, meaning just we only have to get in our boats or let their boats come here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Plowing the deep. Actually, that's, I wanted to title the book that. Title the book that, and my, my publisher said it was too obscure. Know. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, and you know the um, you know he he said that uh, you know he also basically uh, uh, figured out the, the the principle of the specialization of labor. Uh, you know, long before uh, Adam Smith and his famous example of the uh, the pin factory. Uh, he noted that you know the spinner and the fuller and the dyer and the cloth worker must be have to be more skillful at what they do than the general cloth maker. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he realized that specialized shops and specialization of labor was something that produced wealth. And he, he was his problem was that he was just he was seventy five years ahead of his time, yeah. uh, and he just didn't get enough uh, exposure. And the real question, and this is something you might ask you know Doug Irwin about, is is uh, is didn't he in any way influence Smith? I think the answer that he'll probably give is he would probably give it is, is that he didn't. He was just a uh, a man who was you know nearly a century before his time. Well, calling your work considerations upon the East India trade rather than the wealth of nations is probably a, a factor. Uh, so maybe we should listen to our publishers on, on yeah, the titles. Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, probably uh, it was a marketing failure there. I'm going to actually read another quote from him that you give, which I also love. Uh, you know, basically making the argument for why it's good to buy things from abroad when people abroad can make them less uh, expensively than we can. It's a, he says, if the providence of God would provide corn for England as manna heretofore for Israel, the people would not be well em employed to plow and sow and reap. In like manner, if the East Indies would send us cloths for nothing, as good or equivalent of those made in England by prodigious labor of the people, we should be very ill-employed to refuse the gift. Uh, a very uh, eloquent refutation of the fears I think that people have about outsourcing um, and other forms of trade that, you know, basically when you can buy things more cheaply from others, it's a very good idea. Uh, but as you point out, and we can move to the modern period now, a lot of people have in modern times have come to question uh, that uh, virtue of buying things from more cheaply, which, which I want to add two things. One, you have a, a wonderful illustration of comparative advantage uh, in the book, which is, uh, which is extremely difficult to, to write about. Most people – I want to just congratulate you. Most people can't write about comparative advantage. Um, it, it, they they get all uh, tangled up in the word comparative and relative and less relative less worse than and other uh, things and so uh, while we're reading excerpts I'm just going to read a, a, the brief excerpt if I may uh, in your description because it's really quite spectacular. Imagine for a moment 
a famous attorney whose services are so highly desired that his hourly fee is $1,000. Further imagine that he is also very skilled at woodworking, so proficient that he is twice as productive as the average carpenter. Remodeling a kitchen, for example, which might take a carpenter 200 hours, would take our talented attorney only 100. Since the average carpenter earns $25 per hour, our attorney's woodworking skills are worth $50, are worth $50 per hour in the marketplace. If the attorney's family needs a new kitchen, shouldn't he do the job himself, since he is twice as productive as the average carpenter? Not when his legal skills are worth $1,000 per hour. In the 100 hours he spent on the kitchen, he could have earned $100,000 in his office. He is far better off hiring the less efficient carpenter for 200 hours, which would cost him only $5,000. Put a different way, the attorney is better off working five hours in his own profession to pay for the carpenter to do the kitchen job than working 100 doing it himself. In economic terms, the attorney has a comparative advantage in legal work and a comparative disadvantage in woodworking, even though he's phenomenal at it. That's my note. Uh, note that pleasure and preference do not enter into Ricardo's analysis. Our attorney may enjoy carpentry and decide to do the job himself, a valid emotional choice, but not an economically rational one. And I would just footnote it by saying not a financially rational one. Um, and I think that insight of Ricardo's, which, again, you described so beautifully, is um, sort of won the day intellectually among, among – uh, certainly among most economists. It's done – not so well among the average person. I, I think the average person understands it's it's pretty good not to do everything for yourself and not to specialize. But it has not carried the day in the case for, for trade overall. I think a lot of people today, survey suggests that they're extremely uh, skeptical of the virtues of trade. And there are two ways to respond to that. And one is to say, well, they don't fully understand it. The second is to say, well, actually, they understand it better than the economists who've oversold the virtues of trade because while trade benefits uh, the average level of well-being in the country, there may be particular groups who struggle uh, as a result of particular kinds of trade. And I want you to talk about that and um, give, give us your thoughts on where we stand politically. Well, you know, there, there is you – know, this is an audience of economists, so, you know, this is – No, eh, not so fast. Okay, no. all right, well, but I, it's, I an hope. It's, it's an audience <laughs> of people who understand the benefits of free trade. More or less. Yeah. I'd say and, more or less. Yeah, and, I, I, and, and, and you know, those are obvious, and they, they don't really bear, bear repeating here. But what is also indisputable, and this is something I think that, that economists, to their detriment, ignore, is that people really are hurt. Some people, some small minorities of people are hurt. Uh, and, you know, when you look, for example, uh, in this country and you do, and you do polls, you see that it relates directly to, to education and income. People who earn, um, you know, more than $100,000 per year by a margin of almost two to one favor free trade. But if you look at, uh, uh, people who are, are just are high school graduates who only have a high school education, the reverse is true. Um, because if you're, you know, working at the minimum, at the, at the minimum wage, your, your job is very likely to be taken over is very likely to be outsourced uh, and 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 lost, uh, and so this is this is one of the points that I tried to make throughout the book, and I tried to give historical uh, examples of how free trade always uh, harms certain minorities of people. I mean, the most spectacular example that I found was, uh, you know, the, 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 at least in Europe, were the uh, wool weavers of England who were just completely thrown out of work when, when the East India Company began importing uh, cotton uh, garments in, in, in upholsteries into uh, England in the late uh, 17th century. And they actually uh, rioted uh, outside of Parliament and East India House and the, the governors, the governor of the East India Company's house. I mean, this was the, the 19th 1999 uh, WTO riots, uh, 300 years early. So there is this disaffected constituency who is certainly damaged uh, by free trade. And to me, the, the, the challenge, the, the challenge for economists, is figuring out uh, how to support these people uh, and how to win them over. And you know, I think in Europe they understand this a lot better than we do. Uh, you know, if you're going to have free trade and you're going to have people gaining and losing jobs with increasing velocities, you have to have a better safety net. Uh, and to me, the great irony of this political season um, is that the two Democratic candidates who are doing their best to become panderers in chief uh, towards the protectionist interests, if they get elected, if either of them, if a Democrat gets, either of them gets elected, I think the free trance is a 
free trade has a better chance of surviving under them than if uh, uh, John McCain gets uh, elected, who, let's face it, would throw the losers to the wolves. Well, I'm not sure about that. Uh, George Bush, who ran on a very pro-free trade candidacy, was very happy to put protection, uh, give protection to steel workers who he thought would help him politically in West Virginia, and I'm sure McCain will do similar things, and I think uh, the two Democrats will be constrained in that safety net from, for all kinds of reasons. But I actually want to disagree with you on two other things. I want to disagree with you on the 1999 analogy um, to those wool, uh, wool folks in England. The people who were rioting in England 300 years before that were saw their livelihood at risk. The people rioting at Seattle were not the people who were at risk of globalization's effects. They were political activists who, for right or wrong, thought they were helping other people. I think they were wrong, but um, that analogy, I don't think it holds. I, I wouldn't disagree. I mean, I, I think I think I think you're right. Um, it, it's just that it, it's such a totemic uh, event that uh, you know I think the parallelisms are worth are worth uh, calling attention to. But you're right. I mean, the people the people who were who were uh, riding in Seattle were were probably uh, upper middle class yeah. uh, ideologues. And similarly, you know, Europe has a lot of challenges. I, I don't that safety net is um, increasingly tenuous politically. You know, it still has tremendous support. But um, I wonder what the price they're going to pay for it. Uh, they have not been very good at creating jobs. You make it sound like when trade comes along, you know, the jobs get wiped out. And if you're a high school worker, say, and you're a high school graduate and you have nothing left to do, well, you still have something left to do in America because we have a very dynamic market, labor market. Now, you might earn less, and increasingly high school graduates do very poorly. But that's for a bunch of reasons. Trade's one of them. Uh, Technology is the other. Uh, and it, you, you talk about this in the book, the, the attempts to tease out from the data uh, the relative impact of trade versus technology, for example, in, uh, in uh, increasing measured inequality. Uh, I, I think we don't really have a very good understanding of that. And uh, the people who talk about it, I suspect, are, um, are, are merely – Enforcing their own ideologies. So, okay. I, I wouldn't. I, I think that's. I think you have it exactly right. I mean, there's three. There's three. You know, basic. I mean, there is an increasing. You know, the, the question is what's causing the increasing income inequality in the United States. And there's three possible explanations. One is trade. Uh, the second one is 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 the skill premium. Uh, and the third explanation is is uh, is, uh, is is tax policy. Uh, and and I don't know that that uh, there are any data that uh, really enable you to separate the three of those out cleanly. I think, you know, the, the sort of schizophrenia about this is best demonstrated by Paul Krugman, who, you know, in his last book, The Conscience of a Liberal, came out very forthrightly and said, yes, this is, this is all social policy and all tax policy. Uh, and he actually made some pretty cogent arguments in that book. And now, you know, very recently he has a working paper that comes out and says, well, maybe it is trade. <laughs> yeah, I, and, but he also confesses it, the Economist just wrote about this, uh, covered his a recent presentation of his, and said he he does also confess that it's pretty hard to find it in the data, or at least decisively in the data. Um, I suspect it's, it's just such a political issue; it's going to be uh, not the best place for economists to to try to find truth. I suspect. Well, but you know, you do you do you do what any scientist does. You 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 you, you make hypotheses and you uh, you test them uh, with yeah. with whatever data you have. And I you know I think it's it's, it's certainly something that's worth doing. Yeah, I, I have I have mixed feelings about it. I, I, as I've mentioned before, and I do want to say to our listeners, you know, we did a I did a, a solo podcast, which is very unusual, last week on uh, some aspects of inequality, and we will go into those in more detail. I hope down the road. Um, well, I want to turn we, – we've got a few minutes left. I'd like to turn to you personally. You've had a very interesting career. Um, you're a neurologist, I understand. Uh, I thought you were a financial expert uh, because I have two of your books on, on investing, uh, which, uh, which are really superb. And um, now you're an historian. Uh, what are you interested in next? Uh, which which are the? <laughs> yeah, do you well, have a day job or any of these your day job? Well, where do you spend most of your time? <laughs> uh, this is this is this is really embarrassing. I mean, I spend most of my time at home reading and 
and and writing. Uh, I still do. Uh, it's, it's a shaggy dog story, but I'll basically give you the, the capsule version of it. Is I practiced neurology for 25 uh, years. I still do a little bit of teaching just to keep my hand in it uh, because it's a skill I don't want to to give up. But very early in my career in neurology, I became interested in finance for purely selfish reasons. You know, I, I had to save and invest for retirement, so I became involved in the financial world. And in fact, that is my probably my real day job. Uh, is is I do have a small uh, investment advisory service, uh, and and I, I do like writing about finance. And as I wrote about finance, I you know you can't write about finance without intelligently without writing about economics as well. And so after I had uh, uh, you know and I became interested in in, in Angus Madison uh, Angus Madison's work uh, and his contours uh, of economic development. And I, I kept asking myself why 1820. You know why 1820. And and uh, I decided to write a book about it, and my publisher at the time, uh, McGraw Hill, said, "Sure, you can do that." Uh, and so I wrote a third book called *The Birth of, of Plenty*, which was uh, about the institutional origins of modern um, prosperity. Uh, and I found that I really enjoyed the process uh, of uh, of putting together a very complex subject for uh, a general audience. Uh, and so that was my calling card uh, to uh, to this one. I got a phone call about four years ago from uh, an editor at uh, Atlantic Monthly Press who said, uh, you know, we'd like you to write a book about the history of world trade. And I said, I really don't want to do that. And and then my wife, I told my wife about it, and she said, well, do you know who... who who this company is, and I said, "Well, I think so." And she said, "If they, you, you know, she said, if you want, uh, if they want you to write a cookbook, you'll write it." <laughs> uh, so I wound up writing this this book. You have and, a wise uh, wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, she's a very very smart woman. She also knows a lot more about the publishing industry than I do. Uh-huh. Uh, so, um, so uh, that's that's how I wound up. But you know, if, if if I had to give it give it to you in a sentence, I'm just easily bored. I, I like learning new things. So what's next? Well. <laughs> I wish I knew. Uh, you know, I, uh, I I'm, I'm thinking of writing uh, a book uh, about uh, the economics of uh, our, our, our our drug laws uh, mm-hmm. and to look at the costs of our current system, which is hideously expensive, both yep. in capital and human terms, mm-hmm. uh, versus the the cost of legalizing drugs, which would be enormous. Uh, and so I'd like to look at that, and I've always been interested in the history of slavery, and uh, oh, I'm also interested in, in, the, in the shift uh, from defined uh, uh, benefit plans to defined contribution plans in this country, which I think has been a catastrophe, and uh, all sorts of things right. that I'm interested in writing. And I'm, I'm in between books. I don't know what, what, what my next project is going to be. So you're a violation, really, of the Ricardian principle of specialization, right? You should be yeah, specializing I, I, in neurology, which you're made this, uh, which you're presumably pretty good at. Instead, you just quote, keep your hand in, and you're just kind of, and then you're juggling this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. You got three not, specialties. I, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm not. I guess I'm not very economically driven. I'd rather amuse myself than uh, than uh, be a irrational wealth maximizer. Well, that's a luxury which um, an increasingly large number of people in the in the, at least the developed world have, which is uh, I think a great blessing. It is, and it provides uh, blessings for the rest of us. Um, let's close with uh, a topic. You get to at the end of the book because, again, I'm a little bit skeptical of it. I want to hear you defend it. Um, you quote people like Pat Buchanan and others who have argued that the, the, the history of America is a myth. Uh, according to the myth, we were a free trade country. We've always been these great capitalists believing in economic freedom. But in fact, according to Buchanan and, and others, uh, the 19th century in America was a time of great protectionism. That's how we built up our manufacturing base. And um, you know we need to return to those glory days. Uh, you're pretty sympathetic to that, surprising to me, uh, given how much you know uh, about the rest of the world and, and other things. What's the reason for that? Well, first of all, I'm not, I'm not sympathetic to, to, to Pat Buchanan at all. Uh, you know, I think he's a man who can who, who can draw a brilliant canvas, but unfortunately, only one side of it is, is painted; the other side is blank. Uh, you know, he's he's not a very dispassionate uh, analyst. Uh, you know, I happen to, you know, basically, I do happen to believe not only with Buchanan, but also with, you know, Paul Bayrock, uh, and, and even, even Jeffrey Williamson, that, uh, that during, you know, before the, the, the 20th century, trade really wasn't that important to economic development. And in fact, I think even Jeffrey Sachs would, 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 would agree with that. I mean, whatever you think of his, 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 
his opinions of North South uh, um, uh, wealth redistribution, or his earlier work with uh, Andrew Wagner on uh, you know the benefits of uh, of trade uh, and economic development, I think are, are you know still are, are very valid and, and and stand very tall. And basically, what 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 Wagner uh, and uh, and Jeffrey Sachs said was, look. Before 1900, there really wasn't that much international trade. It wasn't, you know, the, the local institutional factors, and more importantly, intranational trade were far more important. In the United States, trade between the states was far more important than trade with other countries. Uh, and so mm-hmm. that was the re- that was the reason. That's the reason why Pat Buchanan can say, "Look, we had all this protectionism uh, in the in the 1900s. Uh, therefore, in the 1800s, therefore, uh, it's a good thing because we grew very prodigiously." And what Buchanan ignores is the fact that trade is far more important now than it was during the 19th century, and you can't afford to be protectionist now. So I, I disagree. I, I agree with him that yes, we became prosperous during the 19th century with a protectionist uh, uh, outlook. But uh, I, I think that he's wrong that that carries through the 20th century. It clearly doesn't. Yeah, I just think the, the empirical work in this area, again, is, is highly suspect. You know, people have looked at – tried to tease out the effects on growth. As you point out, the effects on growth seem to be very small uh, from trade. And I think obviously if you're a large country as the United States is and a diverse country as well, uh, you can do pretty well with uh, through self-sufficiency. Obviously, trade matters less to the United States than it does to, say, Chile um, or, or Zimbabwe, potentially, if Zimbabwe had a more open economy. Uh, my, my puzzle, my problem with that literature, part of my problem with it, besides the empirical uh, hubris of some of it, which I think is unjustified, is the point that you raise in passing, and I, I wish you'd given it more emphasis. A lot of the episodes of protectionism that people talk about are uh, surprisingly ineffective at reducing trade. Uh, so when, when the United States has, quote, high tariffs in the late 19th century, trade's rising dramatically during that time. Either the standard – the reason you give, which I think is, is very – is correct, is that you know, there, there were other forces going on that were working the opposite direction. But it also raised the possibility the law just wasn't enforced very well. Uh, so that nominal uh, – or, or that it was – you know what we call an average tariff is not very meaningful because certain key products were, were had low tariffs. So, I just think the attempts to measure this and quantify it have been fairly um, brutal, uh, uh, blunt. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and even even if it's correct, it's irrelevant in the modern period anyway. Uh, you know, we clearly, you know, clearly now uh, the and, and you know and, and again, you know, I think the other issue, the the other historical episode I talked about with relation to that was the relationship between Smoot Hawley and the Great Depression. I, I, I don't think either of us really knows anyone who believes actually believes that Smoot Hawley caused the Great Depression. It just doesn't pencil out. Well, a lot but, of people are, I think, sympathetic to that idea. But 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 certainly, even if, if even if you believe that it wasn't true back then, certainly you know a, a smooth Hawley magnitude sh- shut off or redu- reduction in international trade now would devastate the world economy. Well, yeah, I think there are two effects there. You know, there, there'd be an enormous short run effect of, of adjustment. Uh, I think the key question is what would be the the trajectory over the next twenty five years. My view on it, it, again, not particularly based on empirical evidence, because I think it's very hard to marshal. But my view on it is that, as you point out, the modern situation is very different than the old situation, not just because there's more trade, although that's part of it, but because the nature of trade is so different. And one thing that I think Ricardo missed, or people who who are Ricardians uh, miss, and I, I say this with some trepidation as a great fan of David Ricardo, but the Smithian insight into trade, which is about the division of labor and specialization, and in particular the the interface between technology and that specialization is really what has created some of the extraordinary growth of the last 150 and I think the next 50 years. And to lose that and to give that up, I think, is the real cost. Uh, and, and I think we've underestimated the impact of that. Well, let me, let me, let me turn, turn, turn the tables around here and ask you the question, Russ, which is, uh, do you think that a, a, a protectionist, a rise of protectionism or a shut off in international trade would actually affect that flow of information and technology? Well, it depends how it was implemented. I think you know, the risk, as you said earlier, and you talk about it in the book, um, the interface between political power and economic power has a sort of uh, self-enforcing effect. Uh, often the, the rise of protectionism will benefit certain groups politically because they'll get more wealthy and 
have more power. Uh, and what's striking to me about the last 25 years of, of American politics is how uh, much talk there is about protectionism and how little the action is. And so it is to some degree uh, pandering, not to some degree, large degree, it's been pandering. For s right now, though, I think we're on the edge of the verge of doing something pretty destructive. Uh, I don't know if we'll do it. I think it's unlikely. There, there are a lot of powerful interests that would try to stop something uh, destructive protectionist-wise. Uh, I'm thinking of, of something, say, serious against China. Uh, if the United States decided to make it very hard for China to export to the United States, for us to import Chinese goods, uh, again, I think most of that would be as symbolic economically for helping the, the people that we're talking about earlier who have struggled in the modern economy. But I think it would be very destructive overall and uh, would be a huge mistake. Now, is that going to happen? Could it happen? I, I don't think so. But if it did, I think it would be devastating. I think it would be if it was widespread beyond China. The United States really did, uh, if a, a true protectionist was elected uh, to the United States, I think it would it would hurt. And, I, and the reason I think it would hurt isn't so much about, you know, we'd, we'd have to make our own toys and our own clothes, more of our own toys, more of our own clothes. That would be extremely expensive. But I think the other aspect, and this is the part that, that I learned from Paul Romer and in thinking about Adam Smith uh, – in a, in a more modern way, and I'll, I want to talk about that in a future podcast. But I think the real issue would be if we limit the extent of the market as we shrink markets down, the, the, the incentive to use technology as widely gets smaller, and you tend to get smaller scale production that is much less efficient. So it's not just that we're going to make the wrong things. We're going to make the wrong things in ways that are not as effective as the way they're made now. And I think that would be very expensive. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that 100%. And there's another dimension to this, which which I did talk about in in the book is is I think that uh, the the intangible uh, benefits of free trade uh, are uh, vastly more important uh, than the than the tangible uh, benefits of free trade. Viewing the Chinese as as symbiotic partners, uh, you know, uh, with whom it is in our direct benefit and our direct interests to get along with uh, is is uh, a much healthier geopolitical uh, uh, attitude than viewing them as uh, economic and strategic uh, enemies. Uh, I mean, that's how wars get started. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. I, but I think it's interesting how a lack of economic understanding really uh, dims the econo that, that sort of uh, – that dividend that I would call a, you know, a peace dividend. You know, when people are told over and over and over again that, that Chinese imports are like an invasion and that their uh, products are winning the economic war, when people see economic activity as, as competition like that, and of course there's a competitive aspect, but there's also a large cooperative aspect, which is that people in China are making our – our clothes and our toys and other so many other products and I you know I tell my kids it's good to buy things from China because they're really poor and this helps them and I you know I don't think there's many parents doing that as there are parents saying yeah we we probably shouldn't buy this but it's cheap so we will and I wish people had a better understanding of uh, the role of cooperation and in international economic activity which is effectively what's going on yeah I mean to me you know some some you know I, I, I've you know, there's some people, in, uh, and, and I think I, I've, I've heard uh, Brad DeLong make this argument uh, that you know the, the rosy view that uh, that uh, trade leads to to peace has many counterexamples in history. But I, I think that you know it's not just listing them up on one side or the other of where one has benefited and the other hasn't. I think what you have to the, sort of the nuclear weapon of that of that argument is to look at Europe. You know, here was a continent uh, which had been at war with itself since the beginning of time, uh, and and I think now with with, with an, you know an economically integrated whole, the odds of any major state in Europe going to war with another one have to be very close to zero. That's a fantastic point. Uh, yeah, I, I would also argue that the uh, the real intangibles as well, besides this uh, the, the peace issue, is the um, the dynamism of life, which I try to argue in my book, the choice, uh, the financial part, the money the money part of trade is good. Trade is efficient. Trade. Buying things from people who make them more cheaply than, than you can is, is always a good idea than trying to make it yourself. And that's, that's the economic – excuse me, that's the financial argument for trade. That's the money side, the budgetary side. But that's only a small part of life. Uh, it's an important part if you're starving. 
But in a well-developed country like the United States, probably the biggest aspect of trade is the dynamism it produces in our economy that lets each generation choose and shape its destiny according to its dreams. And uh, I, I put a lot of stock in that over the monetary side. Yeah, yeah, I, I would certainly agree with that. I mean, there's the, you know, the, and as far as the peace thing goes, I mean, there's the famous argument that the, the quote that's this described to Bastiat, although uh, Frederick Bastiat, although Cordell Hall probably uh, and, and manufactured it, which was that when when goods cannot cross borders, soldiers will. Yeah, no, it's a it's a it's a great line. Uh, if if Bastiat said it, it's on our website, so we'll I'll look for that. Uh, my guest today is William has been William Bernstein, financial theorist neurologist, historian, and many, many other things. He is the author of A Splendid Exchange, How Trade Shaped the World. Bill, thanks for being a guest on Econ Talk. My pleasure, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.